For whatever reason, this night I had to watch it live, so I, I couldn't skip, and it was frustrating me. But I stopped and actually looked at what the commercials were. And I, I noticed there was, you know, about three different categories they fell in. You had some that were for food and leisure, things like your McDonald's commercials, your Buffalo Wild Wings, something that was advertising movies, you know, so your, your food and your leisure commercials. Then you had your informational commercials, the, uh, the little snippet saying, hey, News at 11, we're going to talk about this, or unfortunately, that's time, it's this time of year, the political ads, or, or you know, even some of those don't smoke ads that they come out with on a regular basis. But then I saw the, the rest of them, and this seemed to be by far and away the biggest category. It's what I call the we fix what you broke category. I know we have a lot of visitors, so some of you might not recognize these commercials or these advertisements, but, but we see them here, and you've probably got some of your own local ones. Uh, so Morgan & Morgan, I don't know about you guys, but I, I see their ads on TV. I hear their ads on the radio when I'm driving around. I see billboards for these guys. They're everywhere. You cannot help but see or hear what they've got to say. Or maybe Farrah and Farrah kind of linked up with our, our Jags fans here. We, we've got the, uh, the Jaguar there. So we've got those kind, the, the, the lawyer category. Then we've got, you know, our, our insurance category. You, you've got flow from, from Progressive. We can save you some money and fix what goes wrong. Or, or Jake from State Farm wearing his khakis at 3 a.m. in the morning. We, we, we see those commercials a lot. But then you've got this guy, Mayhem. This guy is by far my favorite commercial to watch when he comes on. He shows up as a raccoon digging through the hole in the, somebody's roof, or he shows up as a fire in the back of somebody's car that's about to explode because they rushed into the game too quick, or what, I mean, a, a water heater that's about to break because he's got duct tape all over him to you know, flood the basement. Maybe the satellite dish that falls onto the car, the tree branch that falls onto the car. This guy shows up and you know something's about to go bad wrong. And as you watch all of these commercials, and like I said, this one seems to be by far the broadest category, the ones you see the most. They're all making promises. They're all trying to tell us, look, there's something in life that's broken and we're here to fix it for you. If you get hurt in an accident, those lawyers, they're going to promise to get you all the money you could ever need. Going through a divorce, well, they're going to uh, keep what's yours and get your parental rights to boot. Or maybe you've been wronged by some big company. They're going to fight for your justice. Or something gets messed up. They're going to make it whole, even at 3 a.m. What they never tell you is that the hurt people still have medical issues the rest of their lives. That the divorces still rip apart the family. The fight for justice is long and tedious. And making something whole may never truly fix all the issues. But they sure try to give us some entertaining commercials. This morning, we're all here because we're celebrating this day we call Easter. We're all here because we know that this life is full of its dangers, its brokenness, its hurts, and its issues. And that the real solution isn't found in a courtroom or a bank deposit. It's not found in the insurance company. It's not found with Eddie Farah. We're here celebrating the resurrection from the dead of Jesus Christ. We are here because that is the pillar upon which all our hope is found. And we're here because it is the real fixer of what's broken within each of us our relationship to God. Go ahead and flip your Bibles open this morning to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're going to spend some time reading what, what this chapter has to say. And I'm, I'm going to go ahead and tell you on the front end. I'm not going to read all of it. There's, there's a whole week's worth of sermons that I could prepare and talk about with different elements of the resurrection. Some of them can take years of study to tr truly wrap your mind around and figure out what's going on. But what I'm going to do this morning is I'm going, to, I'm going to present to you what Paul was presenting to the Corinthians as basically a legal brief. See, what happens is in, in, in verses 1 through 4, he states his case, his, his opening premise 
that he wants everybody to know. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. That's his opening statement of fact that he wants his, his readers to know. Now, as I, I read that, I can't help but think that Paul is a little frustrated by having to say this again. If you read through the book of 1 Corinthians, there's this kind of back and forth that Paul's going through. There's, there's moments where he's like, you guys are just so sinful. I don't get how you think that's right. Man should not sleep with his mother-in-law. I think we know that. You know, those kind of things just are, are wrong. Or how can you, you know, not understand how important love and faith and hope are? That's the core of, of, of what we're supposed to be living like. So I can't help but think that Paul is sometimes frustrated. And so he, he gets through a lot of different things about worship. And then he immediately goes into the resurrection. If we're going to you know, just take everything in 1 Corinthians up to this point and lump it together, it's I've got to remind you of everything that I started with. And I have to take you all the way back to the first teaching I had for you. And that is Jesus died for our sins, that he was buried in the grave, and that he came bursting forth out of that grave to glorify the Father for us. If Paul didn't have something in mind to say to this, this church in Corinth, he could have stopped right there. He could have called it a day. We could say, amen, we're on our way. Let's go have lunch. But there's obviously something that they needed to hear more than that. And I think it's something that we need to hear this morning as well. You see, somewhere along the line, these people got it in their heads that the resurrection from the dead, it wasn't possible. I mean, sure, Jesus did it, but he was kind of the exception, not the rule. Everybody else, we're here, we live, we die, and the legacy we leave is really all there is. That's what their mentality has become. Does that sound like anything we might hear today? I don't usually like to share customers about what's going on with my work, but this one blew me away. This past week I went to somebody's house and I sat down and I talked to them, I measured their windows, went over our, our window product for them, and, and what I found in, in talking to her, she was very well educated. She sounded like she had some, some you know, background in the church. So, Every now and then, I'll, I'll make sure to, to insert the fact that I am a believer. If it seems appropriate, I, I go ahead and do that. She said, you know, after a conversation, that her father and I would have got along famously. He was a third-generation preacher. And I thought, oh, great, you know, third-generation preacher. Here we are at Easter. This is his daughter. She, she must be ready to, to go worship this weekend and, and, you know, think about the immensity of what this day means but I assumed too quickly because as soon as she f finished that statement, she said, but you probably wouldn't like what I believe. So I stopped and said, well, go ahead and tell me, you know, I've, I've got plenty of time. And she said simply this, that she had a near death experience. And at the end of that, she, she said that she had experienced her grandmother who if anybody she knew belonged in heaven, it would be her. And that because that she had experienced her grandmother, she thought, if she's not in heaven right now, then there is no resurrection of the soul. The soul's just sitting here lingering. It's all one big cruel joke, and I'm going to do what I want. It was the most tragic story I have heard in years. It ate me up inside. It ate me up all week long because I'm sitting here and I'm studying this passage on 1 Corinthians 15, and I know that we're going to talk about the resurrection, and all I can hear is this, this woman's painful story of how she can no longer, after three generations of preachers, believe in the resurrection. 
And because she couldn't believe in the resurrection, she could no longer believe any of it. There's a large dose of Greek philosophy and in the debate that, that existed within Judaism that existed in this passage, but it also existed within her. Now, I'm not going to go into great detail about all of those, those, those things, but it's, I want you to understand that it's at play. Because the Greeks, for all that their, their passion could stir them up to, to great works of, of engineering and to, um, to great battle feats, especially the Spartans, they generally like to view themselves as these, these great thinkers, using logical, linear arguments, using philosophical ideas to set them on their path. So Paul sets out to, disbunk, to debunk this idea, much like he would approach, like I said, a legal case. So the, the place that he starts from is that there is a death, a burial, and a resurrection. And then he begins in, in verse 12 through 19 or 20, building his case. Verses 12 and 13. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection from the dead? If there is no resurrection from the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. Paul gets it out of the way real quick what the basis for this debate is going to be about. He says, okay, Corinthians, you say there is no resurrection of the dead except Christ. Well, I'm saying if there isn't a resurrection and Jesus was as much human as you and I, which is not in debate, then he must have stayed in the grave if there's no resurrection. It's the beginning of the theological side of the argument that Paul is laying out. Either resurrection is possible as has been taught concerning Jesus when he raised a little girl in Mark chapter 5, or when he raises G, uh, Lazarus out of the tomb in John chapter 11. Either resurrection is possible and Jesus lives, or resurrection is not possible and Jesus is dead. So while the Corinthians, just knowing what, what the, the history says that they're like, they probably immediately want to start into an open discussion on the topic. But since it's a letter... It's going to be a little difficult for him, so they, he just keeps on writing. And Paul moves into the theological consequences with this line of reasoning. Verse 14, And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead, but he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. So he he starts to use their own logic and turn it around on them. He, he says, okay, look, Corinthians, you're trying to tell me, I'm Paul, I'm the guy who was on the road to Damascus, saw the light, I, I received revelation straight from Jesus. You're trying to tell me, Paul, that what I've devoted myself to is useless? Are you trying to say that not only what I'm teaching is useless, but what you believed in what I taught you is useless. Please tell me you believe in yourself more than that. Please tell me you think more highly of me than that, Paul is saying. But let's not stop there. More than that, if the preaching is useless and the faith is useless, then all the other apostles and Paul are nothing more than a bunch of charlatans. This is where he's, he's building his argument. He says, Okay, if there is no resurrection from the dead, then everything that I've taught, everything you've believed in is useless. All the other apostles are a bunch of false prophets. They're trying to lead everybody astray. Because what we're saying is that God did something that you say isn't possible. And while, while he's on the topic, he, he continues on. He says, do you guys really think that the very being who, who just looked out and spoke life into existence. At the mere word, let there be light. Can you even explain light? I don't know that any, any scientist could truly explain it. And yet God speaks and there is light. God breathes life into clay and mankind exists. Are you trying to say that the God who can do that is incapable of overcoming death, Corinthians? See, what he's ultimately getting to here is their view of God 
is incredibly tiny. In just a few short statements, he's taken it to its logical extreme that God, if, if there is no resurrection from the dead, that God is as weak and as powerless as we are. That's what the Corinthians' ultimate argument is. And once we start down that path, that leads to a lot of not just theological side effects, but some very personal ramifications. If what they believe is true, then Paul starts to lay out those consequences for the Corinthians in 17, or starting in verse 17. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins then those who also have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people to be most pitied. Guys, if Christ was not raised from the dead, your sins are still on you. There has been no taking that sin away without the resurrection. The death, burial, and resurrection are one. We like to break them up a little bit. But the death, the burial, the resurrection are all the exact same plan. He says, look guys, if there's no resurrection, if God is small and weak and powerless as you're, you're essentially saying, then you are still bearing and dealing with your own sins, individually and collectively. And your mothers, your fathers, your sons, your daughters, your spouses, everyone else who has believed with you, if that's the case, then they're still lost. Or are all those who have died believing that Christ was Lord, all those who were persecuted, they died still lost. Or maybe the, we, if we look at the Hebrews 11, the Faith Hall of Fame, if Christ was not resurrected from the dead, all of those people, Paul says, are to be most pitied because they gave everything over the, to this idea that God was planning something bigger. Can you think of anything more pitiful and to follow a cause that you know to be a complete fabrication. That's why when Paul says, if we have hope in this life only in Christ, we are of all people to be most pitied. Because there's nothing else. We have given ourselves over completely to something that provides nothing, but takes all. And the persecution was real for them. The persecution was absolutely real. So of course they would be the most pitied people on the earth, if that were the case. But Paul does not stop in verse 19. He moves straight on into verse 20 and says, But Christ was indeed raised from the dead. Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Now, this word first fruits here caught my attention. It's not something that I think we're overly familiar with, but it's something that if you've studied your Bible, you, you probably have heard at least once or twice. It probably will bring about some sort of an offering in our mind. Um, if you read through the Old Testament, you see all the way back to Cain and Abel. One gave the first fruits for his offering, and his offering was accepted. The other did not bring the first fruits for his offering, and his was rejected caused a lot of jealousy and obviously the first murder recorded in the Bible. But as you continue on reading, the first fruits became really a farming term for the, the first portion that the, the farmer would bring to the temple. And it was a gift to the priest. It was, it was sometimes used as an offering at, at the, the temple. And it gave you an implication. If you have first fruits, what you did with those was of primary importance. But you still have the rest of the harvest. If Jesus is the first fruits, it's of primary importance that God's plan be worked. But his plan continues 
with the rest of the harvest. We are the rest of the harvest crew. We are the ones to still be resurrected. Can I get an amen to that? In Romans 6, verses 3 through 5, Paul writes, Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. Paul makes it abundantly clear, gang. We are still to be harvested. We are still a part of God's plan to take us off this earth, to take us to heaven, to live eternally with Him. And that is why we're here this morning celebrating Easter, because we know that just as Christ was raised for the glory of the Father, we too will also be raised sinless, full of hope, full of purpose, full of belonging. There should be no question for us this morning that the resurrection is real. The, the consequences, both theological and personal, are, are too profound to not be fully convinced in our own minds. And I do not mean the way that, that Blaise Pascal taught it in the 1800s. I'm sorry, uh, before that. Forgot my time frames. Blaise Pascal was credited with saying that we should believe because what's the hurt in it? He basically says that if we were wrong and we believed in Christ, that we really haven't lost anything. But if we're a believer and we're right, we've gained everything. Now, part of me wants to jump on, on board that train and, and write it to the end saying, yeah, that's a great thing to say. Everybody, just you know, do it because you know, really don't lose anything if you're wrong. But you get everything. But Paul says, no. That person is to be most pitied because they're not truly getting the full picture. They're not truly believing. Remember that if we live the Christian life and it's wrong, we are among all men to be most pitied. We must be fully convinced of the importance of what this day represents. This day represents new life. When Jesus rose out of that grave, I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but it's always boggled me. He appears to people but he doesn't look the same. There's something different about him. He's been glorified. And so he has to tell people, oh, okay, yeah, look, it's, it's me. I'm Jesus. See, holes in the hands, you know, spear in the side. It, it's me, guys. So there's obviously something that's going to be different about us in the resurrection. He has created all of us to go through this process. And look, that guy I had up there on the screen earlier, the, the Allstate commercials, mayhem, it's going to happen in our lives. Let's, let's not fool ourselves into thinking that we're going to live the perfect life and, and everything is going to be fine just because we're following in Christ's footsteps. In fact, he tells us the exact opposite is going to be true. But what happens is that Christ led the charge for us. He rushed headlong into death saying, I know that that grave will not hold me. I'm taking your sins with me. I'm putting them to death. I want you to follow me so that you too can also be resurrected. Unlike the insurance companies and the lawyer who claim to fix things for us, Christ, through his death, burial, and resurrection, actually makes whole our life here on earth. And, and he actually makes our eternal being complete through a resurrection just like his. As he glorified the Father so too should we be able to glorify the Father through our own resurrection. Let me close this morning by telling you a story about a little boy named Philip. The story is, is I know, been floating around within the churches of Christ for many years. Uh, I don't know the origin of the story, 
but I know that the, the story seems to at least have a, a kernel of truth to it. Philip was a little boy who was born with Down syndrome. He was a happy child, but there was a lot of difference between him and, and other children his age. Philip went to Sunday school faithfully every week, and, and with his differences, I, I believe that he wasn't fully accepted. He wasn't really a part of the group. But his teacher had an idea for class one Sunday, and he, he wanted to, to drive home a specific point. So the teacher collected 10 egg-shaped containers. I think these were, were really oversized egg-shaped containers, I think the kind that probably used to contain women's pantyhose. But he brought in 10 of these, these giant egg-shaped containers and gave one to each child in the class. It was a beautiful spring day, and the assignment for each child was to go outside, walk around the church grounds, and to find a symbol for new life, put it into the egg, and bring it back to the classroom. Then they would open their eggs together. They would share their symbols one by one. And so, as children in that age group were, were very likely to do, they, they went wild. They ran all over the place. They were shouting and screaming and picking up sticks and picking up leaves and tossing things. But they, they all ended up gathering their symbols and returned to the classroom. Then they all, as one, just put their eggs out onto the table. And they began to open them one by one. And as you can imagine that, you know, kids eight, nine years old, there was, there was a flower, you know, a picture of new life in spring. Uh, another one was open and there was a butterfly. Not sure how they captured the butterfly. Not, not important to the story. And then a third one was open and there was a leaf, a green leaf, not a dead leaf. And then the teacher opened the fourth one and there was nothing inside. Now, immediately all these eight-year-olds, as they're very prone to do, they began to shout, well, that's stupid. Somebody didn't do it right. But the teacher felt a little tug on his shirt, looked down at little Philip, who said, that one's mine. And the other children began to say, Philip, you don't ever do anything right. There's nothing in there. Which could have hurt him incredibly bad. And he could have just taken it, sat down, and, and never said what he was really thinking. But instead, I believe that that young man, Down syndrome and all, was emboldened by the Spirit to say, I did so do it right. I did do it right. It's empty. The tomb is empty. Philip, whose health was poor, died a few months later. And at his memorial service, nine eight-year-old children marched up to the front, not with flowers, but with empty plastic eggs. Philip was right. There is no greater symbol of new life than the empty tomb. That is what we are here celebrating this morning. The tomb is empty. Jesus is not in the tomb. Jesus is alive and the tomb is is empty. It's been said that the resurrection is either the cruelest hoax ever perpetrated or the most glorious truth ever devised by a loving God. This morning, you may be in need of that new life. You may have needed to have the reminder that that tomb is empty and that God is at work within each of us in our lives, preparing for our arrival. Jesus says in his, in his Father's house are many rooms and that he has gone on to prepare for us. This morning, if, if you needed that reminder and you, you've been feeling weak, or maybe if, if you're just looking for that new life for the very first time, we have a song that, that we're prepared to sing. And if, if you're in, in need, I want to encourage you, come forward. Come down here, sit on the front with us. We'll, we're going to have our, our leadership down here ready to, to sit down with you, pray with you. If, if you want to put on the Lord in baptism, to put on that new life for the very first time, we want to help you do that. Whatever it is that you're in need of this morning, 
come take hold of that new life that's been offered. I am a sheep and the Lord is 